Okay. Hello and good afternoon, afternoon, everyone. I am super excited. We have an amazing guest, Senator Janet Cruz. How are you doing today? I'm great. Today is a week two here in the Capitol, and we're going to vote on uh, on the Congressional, the Senate, and the House maps. Well, maybe not the House maps, but the Congressional and the Senate maps. Yeah, that's that's definitely, you know, redistricting has been a big issue this year and for our future has been involved uh, locally in redistricting as well. So that's pretty exciting to hear that the maps are being voted on. Um, so I want to start by taking you way, way back, maybe to your childhood. Okay. I'm curious about hearing from you. A lot of times children um, don't realize that they become politicized at a young age. Uh, for myself, I remember going to vote with my dad when I was seven years old, and it's one of my distinct memories and why I do the work that I do today. Um, so I'm curious about what's one of your first memories of politics? Oh, that's interesting. My abuelo um, was, uh, I, I was born in Ybor City, and my parents were born in Ybor City, if you know Tampa at all. And that's the Hispanic, the Latin quarter of Tampa. And it existed because there were so many um, cigar factories. It was a Mecca, and that's why they call it Cigar City. It was a Mecca for um, the cigar factories. And everything at the time was done by hand. So these immigrants were coming to uh, Tampa because rather than work like the Sicilians, rather than work in the sugarcane fields in uh, South Florida, they could sit in a building, uh, wear a shirt and a, and a Panama hat and roll cigars all day long. So that's how my uh, great grandparents um, ended up in Tampa. Um, but my memories are of my abuelo. He used to have a cafe con leche cantina in one of the cigar factories. And then he would go and work at night as a waiter at the Columbia or the Las Novedades, but he got involved with the union, the waiters union and um, he was very proud uh, when he took his test and became a citizen, even though he never spoke English. And uh, he was a, a, a shop steward, you know, for the servers. And uh, he was a staunch Democrat who believed in the in protecting the working families and the working poor. Um, and so when I was a kid, I would walk with him to the uh, precincts and he would take me in. Back then, it was a big voting booth. It looked like a uh, it looked like some big machine and it had a curtain. So you would draw the curtain for privacy and you could pick each candidate, but you could also pull one lever on the top, either straight Democratic ticket or straight Republican ticket. Mm -hmm. And so he would um, he would let me pull the straight D ticket and it was fun. And that was that was my first and one of my very fond memories of exercising uh, our right to vote in the United States of America. Yeah, that's amazing. And that's also why I think it's so important we bring our children into this work as well um, mm -hmm. and bring them uh, to vote with us into these different spaces so they can get to understand our how our democracy works. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, later in life, my mom was a single mom with three children and a kind of a deadbeat dad. So she just had to work all the time and she was pretty exhausted. So she didn't have the luxury of activism the way that her father did. Mm -hmm. But she was a, and still is a staunch Democrat who never missed an election day. So, you know, I tell people, if you're working your butt off and um, and you can't get out there and be active, then, you know, go on one of the sites and, and give five or ten dollars, not a lot, but mostly and most importantly is you know, plan ahead and make sure that you vote. That's what's most important is exercise that right to vote. And, um, you know, I represent the working folks. I know my district is purple. It's, there are just as many Republicans as there are Democrats in my seat. Um, but I'm a Democrat and I, uh, and I never forget where I came from. And, you know, our vote is our voice. So, if you can't and you don't have the money or the time to get involved and make sure you vote and maybe even take someone else with you. Now, we need to make a difference um, in the uh, in the midterms that are coming up. So, you know, get involved. 
get involved by just voting, you know, and consider yourself an activist and consider yourself being involved by voting and uh, encouraging others to do so. Yeah. And just to share with you, I believe I am one of your constituents. Um, oh, yay. Good. Sure. Yeah. Good. Very good. Yeah. I like so that. I'm excited to be on with you um, just because of that. I get to be with my senator. It's a big deal. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, so kind of fast forwarding a little bit here, but I'm curious about, um, you know, when you decided to get involved with politics in like a bigger way, uh, mm -hmm. what what led you to that decision? Um, was there like a moment or something that made you say, hey, like I can't be on the sidelines anymore? Yeah, there really was. I'd, I'd done a lot of work there was a woman that was a mayor that was up for reelect in Tampa. Her name was Sandy Friedman. And I really liked her and I liked her style. And she was an early pioneer in, in politics and, a and, you know, a real su a supportive person of women, you know, and I liked so much about her and she was, um, you know, she was very engaging in the minority communities and did a lot of work on, uh, on, funds for housing. And, um, you know, she's so ahead of her time when I think about it now, because, you know, affordable housing is such a crisis, but she was working, she had this program called the Challenge Fund, and you could uh, get a very, very reasonable low interest loan to make improvements or to get a roof and some funds from the city. It was, it was wonderful. Anyway, I liked her and I walked into her office and, uh, and said, I want to volunteer and met a whole group of people that were very active politically and um, it kind of sparked my interest. I guess it was my grandfather telling me to get in there. And uh, so I, for years, worked on campaigns. I was very happy. I went from a volunteer to managing campaigns and manage a mayor's race, manage a judge's race, um, but always saw myself as what I'd like to call the queen or the kingmaker, never thought of myself as as the actual candidate um, and I was happy there. And then a seat came open in a neighborhood that I grew up in where I knew lots of people and it was a special election. It was a two month election cycle, which was glorious. And um, I said, okay, I'm gonna do this. And I did and um, it was, uh, you know, I won by 58 votes. <laughs> But uh, I remember the next morning, because it was a special election, I was elected that night and I became the member that night because it was a special. And so um, that night I was exhausted, went to bed, got up in the morning, went over to the state office and there was the computer sitting on this beautiful desk. And I opened the computer and started it and there was the seal for the state uh, that came up on the screen and I looked at the seal and I was like, what in the hell have you done? <laughs> I was scared to death. I'm not a lawyer. You know, I'm an optician by profession. I've worked on campaigns, um, but uh, it has been the most rewarding work I have ever done in my life. And I love, I have loved every minute of it. I've loved the, I love the process. Um, I love the fight. You know, people say to me, how can you do that? There, you know, there's a majority of Republicans in the House, majority of Republicans in the Senate, majority, uh, the governor is a Republican. How can you do that and just, you know, kind of get kicked around so badly? And I tell people, look, the people that built Notre Dame and worked on it forever knew that they would never live long enough to see it finished and long enough to worship in it. And that's, kind of where I am. I, you know, I, I'm here, I'm in the super, not really a super minority, but pretty damn close. And uh, we come up here as, as Democrats and for 60 days, we get our butts kicked. They knock us down and we get up the next morning and we go, is that all you got? Hit me again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, you just get really tough at this and you learned to use um, your voice and you learn to use the press to pay attention to you and to call them out that way. Um, but, and I will tell people to really focus on the governor's race. If 
at least we had a Democratic governor, we mm -hmm. could at least veto some of these terrible bills that come rolling through. Um, and we could control more of the budget and help with so many programs that have been cut. Take, for instance, the Sadowski funds, which is a it's a tax stamp that gets collected and um, it's supposed to be for affordable housing, but every year they sweep within half the money and use it for other things. So, you know, at least let's start at the top. You know, they've gerrymandered districts. So on the statewide um, races, we at least have a, a little bit better fighting chance, I would say. So, you know, take a look at that governor's race and let's put a Democrat in office there. Yeah, absolutely. And we were so close last time. Oh my we gosh. So every you know, every every election it gets a little bit closer. And I really thought we were gonna do it um the last time, but we, we have to just keep trying. Here's the issue too, is that the Republicans have been in power for twenty six years here. Um they have the majority in all three, um, you know, the House, the Senate and and the governor's mansion. Um, it is hard for us to raise money because they hold so much power up here and they just continue to stockpile dollars. They spent probably $20 million to beat me, uh, to try to beat me um, on the last race. And it's just, it's just, you know, if we don't fight as hard as we can, we're just going to, you know, dig a deeper hole for ourselves because it takes a lot of money to win races these days. And, you know, we're to the point now where we actually have national groups coming in um, and helping us with voter registrations and uh, in any way that we can to try to regain some ground here. But it's really a function of 26 years of uh, Republican dominance, you know, and it, it becomes abusive power um, it's tough. You know, I still love it and I still fight tooth and nail. Um, but that is the reality of what's happening up here. Yeah. And speaking of like what's happening in Tallahassee, curious uh -huh. about how are you feeling at this point in session? Um, like what's your sense going into the 2022 session? Um, you know, this is just week two. Um, I have a couple of, a few good bills that are moving, which which is the bright spot. Uh, today we vote on the maps for redistricting and for folks that don't exactly understand what happens there, every 10 years uh, there's a census and based on the census and population, they readjust the, um, the boundaries of all of the seats. So it affects congressional, it affects uh, actually county commissions, but we don't vote on that. It affects the Senate, it affects the House. Um, but the party in power gets to pretty much draw the maps, basically, and mm -hmm. we can kick and scream and holler, but they um, they get to draw the maps. Our only recourse, if we think it's unfair, is to take it to the courts. And, you know, unfortunately, there have been a lot of Supreme Court appointments by the party in power. So we don't, sometimes you even wonder if you have the power of the courts to uh, to kick the maps back. Um, right. So it's very frustrating. It's really frustrating. But the Senate map is not a bad map this time. Um, you know, there are Republicans and Democrats alike that are find themselves a little disappointed that they may have to uh, run against a fellow Dem or a fellow Republican because the line shifted. It was interesting that the growth was not in South Florida the way it has been in the past. It's actually moved to the center of the state, both Orlando and Tampa have explosive growth. Um, so we see an extra uh, congressional seat kind of between Orlando and Tampa, where it, actually that seat should be a Hispanic seat. It should be in Orlando, um, but somehow they've managed to move it um, right out of there. And I'm very disappointed about that. And I'll express that today in my debate, um, but that's what's happening there. I mean, these redistricting lines you know, it's it's a, it's a 10 year sentence when it gets passed um, for the next 10 years. We have to live with the lines that have been drawn. But the Senate map is not bad. And um, we have a leader here in, in the Senate, uh, leader Lauren Book, who is 
really doing a great job raising money to bring senators back, uh, for instance, in my seat, because it's a it's such a um, a purple seat. And when I say that, I mean Republicans, Democrats, red, blue, kind of in the center of purple. Um, it takes a lot of money to hold on to uh, a seat like this. It's based on the midterms and the uh, and the mood of the country. So lots of things can happen. It takes a lot of money to make sure that uh, that we're fighting hard and getting our message across the line. So I am encouraged by the work that she's doing and um, very strategic and uh, really raising a lot of money for the Dems, which we haven't seen in a while. So I'm happy about that. Yeah, I'm curious to hear um, how you feel about housing. Uh, we know that Tampa Bay is has seen the highest increase in housing prices in the nation, uh -huh. about 24 uh, percent mm -hmm. rental increase. So I'm curious about, you know, how do you feel about that? What are things that could possibly be done, especially when we have a government that constantly robs the Sadowski fund? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are um, our options? There was a bill that I saw yesterday that I think um, had some some financing available for builders as long as they uh, provided 10% of that um, for affordable housing. And I see that model in Boston and some other states. I say Boston because uh, someone was talking to me about it, but, you know, it's kind of a mixed use. So you have affordable housing mixed with um with uh, regular priced apartments or condos. And, uh, you know, I think we need more of that, but they need to offer more than 10%. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if you have um, two, uh, 200 apartment or condo complex and you're only offering 10 or 20 units, you know, that is like spitting into the wind, isn't it? So, you know, we've, we've had talk about rent control and um, of course the owners of the properties lose their mind over that idea. Um, we're pushing um, we're pushing our minority population further and further away from the urban core, and mm -hmm. that worries me. I mean, that's where the affordable housing is. I know in Tampa, uh, folks that used to live in my neighborhood, West Tampa, are moving out to Brandon, where it's more affordable. But you know, that's this is a population of folks that oftentimes, you know, if they were like my mom and the way we grew up, you know, our car only worked half the time. <laughs> So it was a bus ride. And when you talk about a bus ride from some of the, uh, the suburbs into the city where you're working, it's really kind of unfair. And, you know, it's always the uh, the working poor that, that suffer through this. So I don't have a good answer, except that I'm frustrated by it and very worried about it. It came up, it seemed, it seemed as if it just happened so quickly in Tampa. So I'm yeah. working with some of the commissioners and um, council people to try to address our housing issue. Um, we need more affordable housing, period. Um, but the the methodology by which we do that, I'm I'm hoping that uh, with the Biden administration, there'll be more money that drops down local. The last thing we want that money to do is stop on the state level because we'll never it'll never never trickle down the way we want it to. So. Um, we talk with our Congress people about making sure the money drops down locally and not on a state level. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, you know, city of Tampa is going to hear uh, about rent stabilization on February 24th. So yep. hopefully there are some options there. Um, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Curious to hear from you about uh, what are some of the dangerous bills um, and every um, year we have scary bills that come up in session. Um, well, in your uh, opinion. so many. Where do I begin? Um, of course, there's always the abortion bills, uh, bills that seek to uh, remove the safety and the rights of women, um, and their reproductive rights. And, uh, you know, there's an assault on that every single year. And, um, you know, for me, it's it's not just about a woman's right to choose, but it's about her right to be healthy and stay alive. It's funny, my grandmother, when she was she was a, the cigar factory worker and she was 90 and 
she said something to me that maybe she wouldn't have said if she wasn't in a different state in her mind at 90, but she talked about being a cigar factory worker in, uh, in Ebor and mentioned to me, it was at, shortly after my dad died. And she said to me that she had three children and a couple of abortions. And I said, no, no, you had abortions. She's like, yeah, honey, there was a woman up the stairs in the corner. And, you know, as factory workers, we didn't have them. I didn't have the money to have another child. And, uh, She's like, you just go in there and she takes care of it. But is that really where we're headed? Are we going to find some woman up the stairs in, in Ybor City or somewhere in East Tampa that will, uh, or South Tampa or anywhere, town and country that will um, perform illegal abortions? Is that really where we're headed? Are we really headed back there? But it's so much more than that. You know, if you look at the Texas legislation where it encourages people to sell on others, it's... Uh, it's a scary, scary state of affairs here. So, you know, we'll hear that bill and it's mostly just red meat for, uh, for primaries. And uh, it's really frustrating. Again, you know, if we had a democratic governor, they could debate it and pass it all they want and we would be able to veto it. So, you know, we stand up and we fight and, you know, it's a constant battle here for women's rights, constant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and my last question for you here today mm -hmm. is um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this Stop Woke uh, bill, uh, which is the bill that the governor has, um, which would basically allow parents to sue because of CRT being taught in schools. Um, it does a lot of things, but one of the things it does is it says that it's like, white folks shouldn't feel uncomfortable because of past racism. It's ridiculous. Honestly, guys, look, we don't teach CRT in uh, elementary school, in middle school or high school. We don't simply do not teach this. It is a, it is a political talking point. CRT is available if you want to take it in on a college level course. It is not in the schools, but you know, people don't know that. So they ramble on and on and talk about don't pick on the white folks that, uh, you know, let's not let's not make people angry at white, white folks for what happened in the past. But this is ridiculous. Honestly, it's not even taught in the schools and there, there's no mention of that. It's just a political talking point. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's something that is a waste, I think, of taxpayers like time it's to terrible. even be look, it's 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 a it's a class that you register for. We're not teaching it. I mean, it's they never mention that, and people are like, Really? We don't teach it in elementary school, we don't teach it in, in uh in middle school, we don't even teach it in high school. We teach it to a more mature mind that's in um in uh in college, and it's you know, so that you can think critically. We're not talking about trying to to persuade children I and mean, this is silly i mean you know we teach black history we teach history of of minorities you know but that's what happens in school so people you know shouldn't be fooled by what's going on here this is just this are just campaign rhetoric is what it is and you know the rhetoric does not match the reality here it's just not true. It's plain old not true. Yeah. Yeah. I I hear you and totally agree with you. You're preaching to the choir here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my last question for you today before we let you go, first of all, I want to thank you so much for being on with us. Oh, you're Jack welcome. Cruz. Call me yeah. anytime. It's my pleasure. Yeah. I Listen, I'm in Tampa, so I will take you okay. up. Okay. Okay. Do that. Really, honestly. <laughs> I'll be home. Uh, I'll be home mid March. All yeah. goes well if uh, if they don't call us back for anything. That's the plan. Yeah, absolutely. So the last question is: What are your hopes for this legislative session? Like, what's what are you excited about, or what's what's bringing you um, joy with this legislative session? Well, my hope is that I pass a bill that's really important to me, and that is a bill that caps the cost of insulin. Uh, for Floridians and um, 
I think most of us know someone in our family or a friend that is a diabetic. Um, insulin is a drug that, that uh, diabetics must have to survive. Um, for whatever reason, they have a pancreas that doesn't produce enough, so they need it. Um, insulin is also a drug that's 100 years old. The scientist that developed insulin sold the patent for $1, $1 so that everyone could have all the insulin that they needed. Um, most drugs that are 100 years old are just about distributed for free. And by the way, um, I think it's worth mentioning in case folks don't know, uh, because I'm excited about it. I saw uh, that Publix has a list of 72 drugs that are available for free. So go take a look and see if there's anything on the list that you take um, and get your meds for free. Also, Walmart has a list of drugs that are $4. So um, for those that are underinsured or uninsured, um, they should take a look at those lists. But moving on. Um, so insulin has, uh, it's there are two manufacturers and this is nothing short of price gouging. It's almost $600 a vial for a drug that's 100 years old. And what happens is, say you're on Medicaid, you, prob you will probably get all the drugs you need. Maybe you're me and you work for the state on this level and you are, or you work for a corporation, so you're pretty well um, covered. But it's that middle layer of folks, the underinsured, the uninsured, um, the small business owners that have very high deductible plans from the marketplace. Um, those are the folks that will ration their insulin because it's so expensive. And the number of people showing up in emergency rooms in what they call ketoacidosis or a diabetic coma because they've been rationing their insulin is growing. And I spoke to many doctors and nurses in the emergency room. They said, it's not one patient a night. It's 10 or 15 patients a night oh, because wow. they simply can't afford it. This is a drug that they must have um, to live. And this is a drug that there isn't any reason that this drug should be the cost that it is other than straight up price gouging. It's, you know, I would equate it to a drug cartel that they're price fixing. So we need to fix this. It's passed in 11 states. It's passed in states that are conservative like Alabama and Texas, realizing that making sure that a diabetic can receive the amount of insulin that they should receive um, makes for a much healthier person and less taxing on the on the system, but you know, healthcare is not a privilege, it's a right. And this has gone too far. So what my bill does is it seeks to take the patient out of the equation. Let, let big pharma and let the health plans duke it out. Um, people shouldn't be going without insulin because there's gouging. And I, you know, I, I intend to ask the um, attorney general to take a look at this, I mean, We've spoken before about price gouging, and this is price gouging at its finest. And what it does is price gouging is killing people. It's really killing people. So that's that's what I'm passionate about. That's amazing. Well, wishing you the best of luck with your Thank bill, you, Senator Janet Cruz. Um, it was a joy and a pleasure to have you on. And Same here. Look forward to staying connected with you in the future. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Bernice. Take care, everyone.